Hello, this is the release for Gearotic 3.0 in the fall of 2016. This is September. Um, each summer I investigate a few things that interest me and I throw them into the program if I feel they have any use. So let's take a look at what's changed um, since uh, the spring. So the first thing that made its way into the program is uh, a new pendulum calculator. One of our users was kind enough to uh, give me a paper on the math of an inertial rotor type of pendulum, so that's been added here in the bottom section. The top section is the same old pendulum calculator we had before. It's basically 2 pi times the square root of the length of the pendulum divided by gravity. Uh, that is only true for small angle assumptions. Uh, most calculators you see on the internet use a small angle assumption. So as long as your pendulum swings no more than about 6 degrees, uh, this is quite an accurate number. However, as you get higher than 6 degrees, this number would get more and more inaccurate. So the bottom calculator doesn't use the small angle assumption. Here you can specify what you intend to make it uh, swing. I hope to make one of these this winter, so uh, we'll show some examples then. But if you enter a 90 degree swing, for example, this means that you intend for the bob to go from 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock and back to 3 o'clock. Uh, time for one period would be 2 seconds in this case, and that's on a uh, pendulum that's only 300 uh, millimeters long. This is because of the two side masses. To use the calculator, we just set the distance that the two side rotors would be, and a mass. Now the mass is a ratio, so if your main bob weighed uh, two pounds and you had a 0.5 as your percentage of mass for the side rotors, uh, that would be one pound uh, on each of the side rotors. These are unitless, so it, the, the mass of this depends on the mass of this. Um, this allows you to uh, make a pendulum which goes much slower uh, for a shorter length. Uh, for example, we could change our length to 150, which is really quite a short pendulum. Uh, move our rotors back in. Your side distances should always be less than your main distance, otherwise they become the uh, uh, too much of a drag on the mass. Uh, so here we're getting 1.3 seconds, but if we make the side rotors three times heavier uh, than the bob itself, you can see we're getting three seconds for a re revolution of 90 degrees, which would be a, a much longer time than you'd normally be able to get with a length of 150. So anyway, that's one change that has occurred. Uh, I hope to show an example of this at uh, some point in the next few months uh, as we try to design a clock using it. Uh, the next change that you'll find is a button down here on the miscellaneous utilities called the Vector Wizards. Vector Wizards actually calls Augie, uh, our motion controller, but it doesn't open the full program. It only opens the vector editor within Augie. This allows you to get instant access to that function in Augie without actually running the program. If you push it, you'll be asked for a profile name. Uh, you can enter in any name you wish. You should create a profile for yourself. That's because the program saves any settings into that profile name. Now, when you first open up the program, it may be quite small because you didn't have a profile, so it picked a small screen size. Uh, just grab the program, put it wherever you'd like it to be on the screen when you open it, and it will remember that from then on and always open up to that size. Now, you don't have to close this. You can go back and do other things in Garotic because you have actually opened up Augie. But the only function of Augie that's opened uh, the whole motion controller section is shut down. The only thing you're using is just this vector editor. Okay, the vector editor looks like the start of a CAD program. That's not really what it is. It's really an architecture for me to put uh, various wizards so that I can do things quickly that I want uh, without having to load a CAD program and figure out how to do it. I'm really not interested in writing a CAD program. There's too many good ones out there. But I have heard from people, for example, who don't have something like Vectric, uh, but they want a quick way to do some text. Either they want to machine it or to laser it and so on. Um, so that would be the reason for this first wizard I'll show you is the text wizard. Here you can select right, center, or left, of course. Uh, enter any text you wish. The character height here, uh, this is in actual units. If you're a millimeters uh, metric user, uh, this would be one inch, 25.4 millimeters. Uh, if it's one for you and you're using Imperial, it would be one inch tall. Um, actually, before we do this, uh, let's take a look at our menu so that we can see um, how to set things up. First of all, with your units, check it if you're using metric. Leave it unchecked if you're using Imperial. Um, tools menu is just another way to reach these buttons down here. 
under display, uh, there's a setting for set default extent. So I have mine set to 400 by 400 because that's the size of my router's uh, table. I have a 16 inch uh, by 16 inch router. Uh, you should set this to the size of your table. You don't always need to show this grid. Uh, you can turn it off if you wish. The origin symbol remains. Um, there's other tools here like show direction cones which I'll explain in a bit and you can have a millimeter or inch grid and you can do this whether you're in uh, normal units of metric or English or not. Sometimes you just want to switch to an inch grid to see how it might fit some woodworking machine that you're doing. Um, under chains you have various selections to open and close contours, delete and so on. Under layers uh, we can create layers and copy chains from layers and so on. Under the file, we have load DXF, save DXF, import G code you cannot use unless you're running Augie. Augie has the capability of importing it from a G code program and creating a DXF. Uh, you can use export selections to bitmap. That's one of the primary uses of this module, really, is for people who wish to raster or create binary bitmaps for other uses. Uh, this program although it does allow you to draw lines and circles and uh, squares and so on, it does not really deal in entities like lines and arcs. Uh, it, internally it does, but to the user it deals in chains. Chains are collections of objects or contour shapes, and in future uh, wizards will take advantage of that fact. So here under mouse mode we have uh, select, which is uh, simply for uh, creating a selection drag on your mouse, you, you can select over something. We have lines where you can uh, click and draw lines on the screen. Clicking the second spot on the same will end those lines. Again though, this line becomes a chain. If we look up at the layers menu, you can see the main layer now has one chain on it. Even though we drew uh, several lines, uh, it sees it as one concurrent entity, one chain of events. Um, same thing with a box. If we draw a box now, uh, we're now told we have two chains. The box is an entity uh, called a chain and so are the lines. Uh, same thing for circles and so on. But the only reason you can draw these things really is to give information to a wizard and that's why these drawing commands are, uh, are on the screen. Uh, over time arcs and beziers and so on will be added but not so much as drawing tools, but as ways to enter data into various wizards that you might use. I'll explain that as we go. Uh, here I'm going to select all these and there's a button at the top, delete selected chains, uh, and we can just go back to our blank screen. I should mention that this uh, module is very young, so expect bugs uh, and expect it to change fairly rapidly, I would think, as more toys and things are added to it. Um, we have uh, under the mouse mode aspect lock and angle snap. Uh, this is if you're drawing things you can snap to 22 and a half degree angles. Uh, aspect lock is if you're going to move something you can stretch it if the aspect lock is turned off. If it's turned on you, you cannot stretch or distort an object. Um, the override section, although they will show up as you draw, for example if I do a line, uh, as I'm drawing my line this, these boxes are showing the end effects. Uh, it is planned for you to be able to type into those boxes to manually enter uh, various angles and so on to get a drawing to go your way. Uh, but again, it's not meant to be a drawing program and I haven't gotten to the stage yet where I've activated those overrides. So we can delete those chains. All right, so we get to the main point of the uh, module really is the wizards, and this is the section that will grow over time. I have had requests for things like uh, getting vector data from text uh, and so on, so let's take a look at the first module, which is just a simple get vector from text module. Um, the character height here is your vector height, so if you want to make one inch letters, character height of 25.4, if you're a metric user, uh, would create a one inch character. Um, The module will use any fonts that you currently have loaded. Uh, after you've typed your text, you can scroll through the fonts and you can see them in real time what you're going to get. Um, even a fancy font like this will be changed into vector for machining. And 
uh, you're free to change its size by dragging it and so on after you put it on the screen. If you drag and select something, it will turn green to let you know that those are selected vectors. To, to uh, enter motion mode, you're going to need to select them a second time. Uh, basically, usually clicking on the upper corner of any entity uh, will select the entire uh, process when you've got something in the primary selection mode. So you can then drag it, move it, but you'll notice it's staying in aspect, and that's because this aspect box is checked over here. If I was to uncheck the aspect box, uh, reselect the object, you'll notice we now have handles at the top and bottom so that we can stretch text and move it around. You notice the text is all machinable vectors, even though it was a fancy font. Um, we can also, you can save this as a DXF. You cannot yet put it out as G-code or anything, uh, but the DXF you put out, any program should have no problem making toolpaths from it. Uh, you cannot yet load DXFs into Garotic's uh, toolpath generator, although that is planned. Um, one other function you can use is you can put it out as uh, a bitmap. Up here under File, we'll say export selections and there's a preview button so that you can see what you're going to get as a bitmap. Here you can set the resolution in pixels of the bitmap. If you're lasering you sometimes want a higher pixel resolution uh, for some other programs it wouldn't care. This program will create a uh, binary bitmap so these are single uh, lines at the moment you can increase their stroke to make them thicker but I'll warn you that on some vector operations increasing a stroke uh, causes pull-offs such as these in some of the areas. You're usually better off with a stroke of one uh, for most machining purposes. You can hit fill uh, and, and fill the text instantly or get an inverted fill. Uh, so these are handy to save as laser raster drawings uh, to use in Augie's processing for uh, rastering laser images. Uh, that's one use of the um, bitmap output. I'll show you others uh, when we get to it. Uh, so, okay, that's the text module. Uh, again, you can use any font. You can italicize it and so on. Let me know if you need other tools in the text. Um, when you have text, you can, when you have anything actually, you uh, once selected, you can also rotate it in addition to stretching it and uh, so on. So that's the text module. I think that uh, most people can figure that out from there. I'm just going to delete that and we'll take a look at the ruler wizard. The ruler wizard uh, is a way of making clock faces. A clock face is really a ruler, uh, as is a compass or a tachometer or many other items. Uh, I'm going to zoom in on this here. Uh, because it doesn't know what size you're going to be looking for and it's a wizard to get you the general shapes, it will create what you're asking for and allow you to stretch it later to whatever size that you like. Under quick starts, these buttons are really just presets and they just automatically fill the numbers into the following two pages. These two pages allow you to generate any type of ruler shape um, that you might have use for. So if you find a bunch of settings yourself uh, in these two uh, dialogues which end up giving you uh, a shape that you find useful, a tachometer or something, uh, let me know and we can add it to the uh, quick starts uh, so you'll have instant access to it. Uh, so what's on the screen now is a compass. You could have a clock face, another type of clock face. Uh, you could have a ruler which is meant to be tilted up to be vertical, uh, horizontal, and there's an endless number of possibilities really when you start playing with the shapes within it. Um, whenever you hit apply, you'll apply the changes that you've made to any of these screens. For example, here I've said the ruler length is 100 units. If I change it to 125 units and hit apply, uh, you can see what's changed is it now has more increments to it. I've only told it on the legends page to uh, count from 1 to 12 so it's filling the increments 1 to 12 and it has nothing on the, far f on the following two increments. Um, so anyway, changing these and playing with these you'll find that you can manipulate the rulers uh, to generate most shapes that you might want. Uh, don't bother stretching this to a size until after you've hit OK. If you hit cancel the drawing will disappear. Once you hit OK it becomes a permanent vector source and you can do any of the stretching or moving that you like to with it. Um, let me know if you find that you need more selections or more tools in here to make the type of ruler shapes you want. Uh, the reason that this was made was uh, to allow me to laser rulers and so on onto jigs. Uh, many of us make woodworking jigs and 
you might want dial indicators on a mill or a lathe. Uh, this will allow you to create the rulers necessary at the right lengths that you could actually machine this onto a dial, uh, uh, switching your Y uh, to an A axis. That would allow you to uh, engrave a dial on the outside uh, at the right length with whatever font le numbers and letters that you might want. So anyway, that is the uh, ruler wizard. If I hit OK, this becomes a permanent 100 centimeter ruler, 100 millimeter ruler rather, um, and you can do with it as you wish. Save it as a DXF and then machine it uh, any way you like. All right, I'm going to get rid of that. We just delete that with a chain delete, and we're back to our screen. A double click will take you back to your screen. If you find that you've tilted your screen out, just double click and you'll get back to the main extents of your screen. Okay, so this next wizard is the result of a bit of an obsession that I had during the summer. Uh, after creating a clock face, I decided it looked a little bland and I wanted to have a bit of a flourish on it, the way we see on many grandfather clocks. Uh, trouble is, I'm really terrible at making things like flourishes. Uh, they take an artistic temperament I don't seem to have. So I decided I would try to create a flourishing wizard. Uh, and that's a tough call because creating something artistic really normally requires an artist. Computers aren't very good at it. So I thought I'd give it an attempt anyway and I put the Flourish Wizard in because I do think it's useful in some circumstances. I just push the Flourish button and I get a message, draw guides in Flourishing later and press again. What it's asking me to do is to draw a box within which it will put a Flourish. Let me draw one in the full size of my table here. If I now push Flourish, it's going to ask me what type of Flourish I would like. I'm going to hit auto and uh, we'll do a three-part example to show you how the thought goes. When you push auto, you'll be asked for uh, the name of your flourish layer. I just leave it to flourish usually. It's quite easy to delete and move around layers up here. And you're asked for a fertilizer number from 4 to 25. Fertilizer really uh, sets the frequency of the flourish, how busy it is. The more fertilizer you give it, the more unruly the bush will end up being. So let's make a very small one, uh, which is a four. I'll explain this motif number in a moment, but uh, generating a small flourish, which will always be the same, uh, you can just enter a fertilizer number and hit OK. Uh, and here's a flourish. This, the uh, message box I just did, by the way, was lying. It's actually, you can enter a number from three to 25. All right, so here we created a uh, flourish, and I have a box around it because that's the box we drew in our for flourishing layer. Oftentimes, if you generate a, uh, the flourishing layer, you don't want to see the box, so these light bulbs be beside the layers, we can turn off the light bulb for the flourishing layer. We know that we're going to put it on a box the size of this table. So what our flourish did was uh, generate a little, um, well, a flourish, a vine, uh, which you may or may not find to be artistic looking. But there are other ways to uh, modify the vine to make it look even better. Uh, let's take another flourish. We'll use the same flourish box. If I delete the flourishing layer, I would be asked again to draw more guides. But since it already has a layer named flourishing, it will use the same guide. I'm going to enter a three here and get a smaller flourish. Now that small flourish, uh, I'm going to pick it by uh, clicking on its layer. Uh, first of all, to uh, let me mention to deselect everything, just click away from everything so they're deselected. Then on any layer, you can click the layer once to select it primarily. A second time will select it for motion. So let's take a look at that flourish. This was a three flourish. Again, something that you might want to stick at the bottom of a picture frame uh, or in the middle of a clock uh, face as a flourish. I'm going to take that and put it right on top of the previous flourish that we've made. Now it looks a bit of a mess, but let's make another flourish that's even higher frequency. Let's give it a 7 and generate a 7 flourish. Now this really looks like a mess, but we have a tool in our vectoring uh, called Add where we can add vectors together. I'm going to hit Add and this can sometimes take a moment, so when you see the screen flash, it's done. Um, in this case, it's done very quickly because it's not all that complicated. Now, it still looks like a mess, but our addition layer uh, was made uh, on top of everything else, so we want to move it. So I'm going to click away to deselect everything, and then roll all the way down, and we can see we have an addition layer. 
If I click the addition layer again, once selects it, twice makes it movable, and I move it out of the way so that we can see what we got, we have a fairly nice looking decoration. Um, maybe a little busy, uh, but these types of decorations depend uh, a lot on you and how you create uh, the objects that you're creating. The vector addition allows you to add vectors together and by incorporating a low frequency image with subs subsequently higher frequency images uh, you end up with a type of motif that looks uh, at least artistic or more artistic than I can be without my computer. So I thought it might come in useful for people. In fact I took it to some extremes and you can actually generate flourishes which are unique to yourself that uh, you won't see anybody else repeating. Uh, let me show you an example. I'm just going to uh, delete these chains. Double click to get back to center and let's create a flourish auto which is fairly uh, large. Let's give it a, a, a 12 say as a fertilizer. Now the motif down here will make your flourish different um, from flourish to flourish and you have to think of it as a repeated number which always uh, keeps repeating itself as a tone uh, as like a, mu a series of musical notes that create the flourish itself. This is very hard to explain because it's it's a heuristic that really makes no sense uh, in any math terms or anything but if I type a number such as what's on the screen, 121232, two, two, there's no harsh jumps in that number sequence. It's a fairly smooth sequence. It's like do, re, mi, do, re, mi. If I use that, I'll get a flourish which looks like this, which again could be useful for someone who wishes to use it as a filler or a background. Let's do the same flourish, however, with the same 12 and let's change the tonal sequence so it's harsh. One eight one eight one two two. Um, again, this is hard to explain, but I would consider this to be a harsh changing sequence. Uh, as musical notes, they would be quite discordant, and they'll create a somewhat more discordant um, image. This image will have larger rounding gaps. It won't connect quite as well. It'll be somewhat more chaotic because the notes were more chaotic. Let's try it again. Same 12, which is again the bushiness of the vine with a strange sequence and that sequence happens to turn into this. And This is the thing about an auto an auto-generated flourish. You don't quite know what you get, you know the approximate size of what you're going to get, but the numbers that you enter uh, create an infinite variety of these flourishes um, and by experimenting you might find one that is uniquely suited to your application or to a look that you particularly like. Uh, as a signature, it makes a nice signature that no one else is likely to duplicate easily. Um, and it's all dependent on the fertilizer and the um, tonal sequence that you enter when you generate them. Again, play with this and it becomes a bit more intuitive as to what you're going to get. All right, I'm going to delete all these and we'll take a look at yet another way to make uh, flourishes because again, I, I went at this a little bit uh, too much. I'm going to hit flourish and we're going to do a photo based flourish. Now here you get a few more settings. Uh, the idea is that you could load a photograph. Here's a photograph of the Pope for example. It separates the Pope into areas of importance and you can change these areas with uh, various thresholds uh, to get images that are going to control uh, where your vines are going to grow to but only in a minimalistic way and again you'll understand this as you play with it. This requires a, f a circular pack solving mechanism which um, it's, it's like an artificial intelligence. We send out a beehive of activity and it fills the uh, object with them. So here's our swarm going out to try to find a comfortable fit for a vine platform onto that photograph. And when it stops, you'll hear a cymbal sound, and we just heard it. And from this point, we could, if we wish, uh, save this as a bitmap if for some reason we want to have a bitmap that looks like that. Um, 
we could change it into vector circles and put it out on as vector circles for machining in some process. Uh, we could create a vine from it. And if I create a vine, you can see now how vines grow. They actually grow into a circle pack surface. Now I can go down and select that vine and just the vine and move it out of the way. And as you can see, it doesn't really look like that Pope. Although if you know what's generated from the Pope, you can certainly see uh, similarities uh, to the drawings. This is a trick quite often seen on the internet where they show you a process which is supposedly 3 d but they superimpose a photograph over the top. It fools the eye into thinking it's more 3D than it is. If you're familiar with that Pope's picture, this one is quite easy to see a recognition to it, but by the time you get to a vine, it's not exactly dead on. It does, however, give you a decorative vine that's in a motif that would be very hard to find without a photograph. So the photograph really just lends a, um, an ability to create a vine that kind of matches what you're looking for. Again, this is all very difficult to do um, to say I'm going to create a vine which is artistic because uh, that implies that you need an artist and uh, like I said, I'm not one but you may be one. Let's create another one of these as an example uh, to show how much further you can go. Let's take a photograph. Um, here's a photograph of a wax statue head. I'll raise my limits to uh, try to get just areas of interest. Now you can set the minimum and maximum circle radiuses when you do these things. Let's solve the image. Uh, they can take a little while to solve. You can save these, you can stop this at any time and save a bitmap if you'd like a rather unique photographic image uh, superimposed with bubbles. And you won't always be guaranteed a fill. If your bubbles are too small, you may only get a partial fill on a photograph. But um, for something to look artistic, sometimes uh, I find that actually helps. All right, so I'm going to tell that to create a vine. And here's our vine of that guy standing there. Uh, if you're familiar with the picture, again, it can look, it looks more like him than if you're not familiar with the photo. But you can create symmetries as well with the program. Here we have a mirror. And under mirror, we can either flip something horizontally or vertically, or we can check symmetry and say we want to create a symmetry. If you check symmetry, select the side that you want the symmetry to be on. In this case, I'll select a horizontal symmetry. And a drawing like this could look uh, very nice around a picture frame or something as well, although this one's perhaps a little busier than what it should be. Uh, that's about all the tools that uh, are on the vector screen for now. Again, more, um, more things will be added over time. Um, let's take another look though at a bitmap output of a flourish so that you can see um, that the bitmap its process itself can actually change uh, one of these flourishes. So here I have a flourish on the screen. Um, let me go show you what a normal bitmap would look like of that. Here we preview and let's fill it. Okay, so that's a bitmap that we could raster laser onto something. Let's copy this bitmap though, and let's paste it. And I'll select that chain, and I'm going to put it just a little bit offset in one direction. Now it makes for a fuzzy looking image, almost like you're looking at a 3D image, which isn't. Uh, but if we export to bitmap, Take a look at the preview here. You can see it looks uh, blurry, but if we hit fill, we get a, a, a calligraphy image uh, of a vine, which again can make a nice looking graphic on, on some machined items. So anyway, that's it. That's uh, what's in the program for now. I hope you find the utilities useful. Uh, we'll discuss on the forum uh, more additions and more things to add. If you have ideas for things that you would like to be applied or processes that would you'd like to see applied to a vector, uh, of your own because again you can do any of these tricks with vectors that you load yourself. Uh, let me know on the form and we can talk about adding that into the program as well. Uh, thanks a lot, have fun.